The Minister of the Marine of the Colonies received the following report from Lieutenant de la Vassier on the 10th of February, 1857, on the loss of his ship, the Dirac. Quote, Fifty days passed on a sandbank at rough work under a burning sun or torrents of rain, and twenty-eight more of a passage during the last days of which we were distressed by hunger had exhausted the strength of all. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The Duroc Finds Mellish Reef. Here we are. Enjoy! The ordeal for the people on the Duroc, a wooden steam corvette that served as part of the French Navy, began with her departure from the French colony of New Caledonia on the 7th of August on a return trip to France. She was sailing under the command of Lieutenant de la Vassière, who also had on board his wife and his four-year-old daughter, Rosita. In total, including Lieutenant and his family, there were 64 people on board as she departed from New Caledonia. Nothing happened of note for the first few days of her voyage. Unfortunately, on the night of the 12th, her course brought her directly onto the Mellish Reef. Up until the Duroc found herself on the reef, it had been a completely unknown navigational hazard, not on any charts, and therefore had not been of any concern for those on board the Duroc who had not known to look for it. Soundings also would not have been much use until they were right on top of it. The water was very deep around the reef until it wasn't. The people on the Duroc were forced to spend the rest of the night until the morning of the 13th in suspense, uncertain of what they had hit and what their future situation might be. Worried that they were on rocks and the ship would soon be driven to pieces, Lieutenant de la Vassière ordered that all the food and water be brought and piled on the deck for speedy evacuation, if need be. In spite of the suspense, it was reported that everyone on board, down to four-year-old Rosita, was calm and collected. As morning broke, they found themselves faced with a small patch of sand about 700 feet wide and only a few feet above sea level. This at least offered a refuge, since it was quickly determined by Lieutenant de la Vassière that his ship was past saving. Since the Duroc was not sinking, simply stuck hard aground, it did give them an opportunity for an organized departure from the ship. Lieutenant de la Vassière gave the order for the sick to be evacuated to the beach first, and then began to organize the work of stripping anything that might be of use from the Duroc. All of the food and water from the ship was taken on shore, as was the water distilling device. The ship's small boats were not enough, so they soon had taken apart pieces of the ship to create makeshift rafts. Lieutenant de la Vassière reported that, on a couple of occasions, his men were forced to drive sharks off with boat hooks while working on the rafts but they were too useful to abandon. With these, they were also able to bring ashore the oven and the forge. Once the group had set up camp and erected tents on the sand, they had time to make plans for the future. The biggest problem they had ahead of them was that the boats from the ship were not enough, or large enough, to carry everyone on board, and the rafts would not be sufficiently seaworthy. With this in mind, on the 23rd, Lieutenant de la Vassière gave the order that the wreckage of the lower masts, bowsprit, and spars of the wrecked ship be repurposed, and the crew set to work building a 45-foot-long pinnace that he named the Deliverance. By now, they could also determine how they were going to fare as far as supplies. The water distiller was doing good and efficient work, so they were not concerned about drinking water. The pinnace, Lieutenant de la Vassière estimated, should be done at some point in September, but it also would not be able to hold everyone. 
Not only that, but the supplies on the island might not last that long. It was decided that it would be best if about half of the men set out in the ship's boats while the rest remained on the island to build the deliverance. On the 25th, 31 people set out under the command of Midshipman Magdalene. Spread out between the longboat, the jolly boat, and the ship's gig. With them, they brought the only man who had been injured in the shipwreck, in the hopes of finding him medical attention. One of the sailors had fractured his shoulder bone on the ship's wheel when the vessel had struck on the reef. On the same day that the three boats set out, they ran into difficulties and were forced to change plans. Lieutenant de la Vassier had told them to head to the coast of Australia and head for the Torres Strait, where he thought they would have the best chance of encountering another ship. The seas were choppy as they set out, though, and the small boats were heavily laden. Almost as soon as they set out, they began to take on water. While it would have been best if they had been able to lighten the load of the boats, this would not be practical. The boats only had supplies for the men to live on for 25 days, and that would be at reduced rations. There were only a couple of people on the boats at all who knew how to steer, and the boat under the charge of the bosun was particularly likely to get lost if the three boats got separated. Lieutenant de la Vassier also was concerned about this, and told Midshipman Magdalene to tow the other two boats behind the longboat so that there was no chance of separation. It took less than a day for Midshipman Magdalene to realize how impossible the instructions of Lieutenant de la Vassier were when put into practice. The boats were too heavy, and the seas were too rough for a long voyage up the coast of Australia, even if that was where they were most likely to find another ship. Instead, Midshipman Magdalene decided to steer for Cape Tribulation, since this would be the closest place on the coast of Australia from where they were and also easily visible from a long way off, in case they did get separated and had to depend on people unfamiliar with navigation. There was also a not unreasonable chance of their separation, since tying the boats together proved to be impossible. They tried on multiple occasions, but after the tow rope broke three times, they gave up on the idea and just did their best to stick together even though Midship and Magdalene was very anxious that they would be separated and lost. On the 27th, two days into their voyage, a new disaster struck. The seas became so rough that the boats were in danger of being swamped from moment to moment, and anything that was not completely necessary for their survival had to be thrown overboard. The same day, Midshipman Magdalene was standing in the longboat to take the noon observation and determine their position when a giant wave suddenly washed over the longboat. Since Midshipman Magdalene was the only one standing in the boat, he was the only one washed out of it, and he was soon picked up by the jolly boat that had been traveling behind the longboat. Unfortunately, the other things that had been washed out of the longboat with the wave were not so lucky. All of the navigational instruments were gone, as were most of the provisions for the men in the longboat. Lieutenant de la Vassier had also sent them with a report of the loss of the Dirac and letters of introduction for the authorities of any location they arrived in. And these, too, were all gone. Fortunately, not everyone in the longboat remained shocked for long, or the situation could have been much worse. The quartermaster at Leary and a sailor named Bureau acted quickly, and while the quartermaster grabbed the helm of the ship, Bureau rushed to lower the sail and put the boat's head to the sea. As the longboat rowed to join the other two boats, again they were able to pick up cask of water and some ship biscuit that had washed overboard, but they were still missing most of their provisions. There were now also only the observations of the officer in charge of the jolly boat to bring them to their destination. On the 30th of August, the boats reached Cape Tribulation and passed a night at anchor. Midship and Magdalene relaxed a little, thinking the worst was now over, and the next day they took a calculation of what provisions they had left between the three boats. In total, they had 72 kilograms of biscuits, 
20 liters of brandy, and 60 liters of wine. They were also able to resupply their water from some streams on the shore, though landing proved difficult. With these provisions, they headed for the coast of Australia, as they had been instructed. On the 9th of September, they reached the port of Albany, with much of their provisions still intact. They had been able to shelter near islands, fish, and get water from shore. This proved to be a boon since Albany proved a disappointment. Midship and Magdalen had expected there to be an English settlement or British ships when he reached Albany, but there were neither, only some dried up streams that would not even allow them to refill their water supply. Here, midshipman Magdalen was forced to make a new plan. Their best choice, he decided, would be to head for Kupang in Indonesia, where there were definitely going to be European vessels. For a little while, he considered stopping in New Guinea to get a supply of coconuts that they could use as provisions. But without charts, he was worried about getting lost if he added additional stops to their voyage. They divided the remaining supplies between the three boats according to how many men were in each boat, and according to Midshipman Magdalene's calculations, they should have enough supplies for up to 12 days at sea. By now, they were all exhausted, but Midshipman Magdalene did what he could to raise everyone's spirits, and they set out again on the 10th of September. This leg of their voyage proved uneventful until the 17th when they suddenly found themselves becalmed. For the sailors, who were exhausted and dehydrated already, the prospect of now having to row caused deep despair. The water they had left was now in very low supply, and as the men had feared, after one day of rowing, many of them were in very poor condition. Through the night of the 19th and into the 20th, Midship and Magdalene could only offer the example of himself taking the oars and rowing encouraging the men with how much cooler it was during the night compared to the daylight hours. By dawn on the 20th, they could see land ahead and the men who had been close to giving up once again took the oars. The first place they landed did not offer food or water, but traveling along the coast in their boats, they arrived in Kupang on the 22nd of September, having found water along the shore as they traveled, but not having had anything to eat since the 21st. It had been almost exactly a month since they had left behind the wreck of the Durak. The governor of Kupang, on hearing what the men had endured, immediately gave them a place to rest, medical attention, and all the food they needed. With the assistance of the governor, Midshipman Magdalene was able to sell the three boats and what was left in them for money to support his men and he and the people with him were placed on a monthly packet ship that was bound for Batavia. With him, he took a letter from the governor of Kupang, telling the governor of Batavia to assist them in returning to France and to take good care of them while they were in Batavia. In turn, Midshipman Magdalene left information with the governor of Kupang about where the wreck of the Durak was and what circumstances he had left to those who remained with her. The people who had departed on the three boats were on their way to Batavia before the people who had remained with the Dirac were ready to also make the voyage. Thirty people, including Lieutenant de la Vessier's wife and child, boarded the Pinnace the Deliverance on the 2nd of October. They had already spent fifty days on the sand, and they were eager to escape before their supplies ran out. They were in for a rough voyage. The pinnace had been built under the supervision of the ship's master carpenter, but they only had available what they could salvage from the Duroc, and so their boat was a leaking one. The Deliverance also made a stop in Port Albany. In their case, they only stopped for a couple of hours, though, just long enough to patch a severe leak that ran the risk of ending their voyage completely. They, too, did not meet with any ships and they were not able to make the voyage to Kupang any faster than the small boats had been able to. It seemed as though, if nothing else, their voyage was going to be a more comfortable one than the one experienced by the men under Midshipman Magdalene, at least until the 27th of October, 
when a violent western monsoon set in. What followed was several days of terror for the people on board the small deliverance. At one point, the crew requested silver cross that Rosita was wearing around her neck to be replaced at the bow of the ship for protection, something that the four-year-old agreed to on the condition that she would get it back. On the 30th of October, the battered deliverance arrived in Kupang. It having taken them exactly as many days as it had taken the party under Midship and Magdalene, and their party was just as hungry and exhausted as the other half of their group had been. They too were met with kindness by the governor of Kupang, and also put on board the Batavia packet. But the bad weather that had plagued them in the final days of their voyage was not over. Four times the packet attempted to fight the monsoon and make it across the Java Sea, and four times it was driven back to Makassar. On the last attempt, it was so badly damaged that they were forced to remain in Makassar for a month. During this time, a frigate from the Netherlands called Palembang welcomed the castaways on board and nursed them back to health until they could be placed on a new packet. This packet was also driven back to Makassar once before it did finally reach its destination. The men under Lieutenant de la Vassier set foot in Batavia on the 6th of February, 1857. Their return to France from Batavia was an easy one. They were distributed between French merchant vessels and headed home. In the reports of the loss of the Duroc, the exact location of the Melish Reef was repeatedly given, a new navigational hazard to be aware of. In September 1859, a skeleton triangle beacon was constructed to mark its location, made out of the remains of the Duroc, which were still grounded on the reef. Unfortunately, this beacon was not to remain. Ten years later, it would blow down and not be replaced for some time, leading to further shipwrecks. There was even an attempt made to plant trees in the sand as a makeshift marker by at least one captain, but the land was not suitable for them. In 1890, an Australian whaling vessel decided to stop and investigate the Mellish Reef. There, they had the chance to explore the ironwork and engines of the Duroc, which was reportedly in very good condition considering that the ship had wrecked over 30 years before. Both Lieutenant de la Vassière and Midshipman Magdalene had nothing but good things to say about all of the men under their command. In each of their formal reports, they called out specific men down to the lowest rank of sailors who had behaved well, kept the spirits of the others up, and done more than their share. Both officers had managed to get their parties back to France without a single man lost. It seemed as though it was almost a miracle to many, considering the circumstances. It certainly did to much of the public in France, who reportedly confused little Rosita by repeatedly asking to touch the silver cross she wore around her neck. It had been given back to her as promised. For more information please see the Sydney Morning Herald from the 17th of June, 1857, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.